Okay, thank you so much for joining us, Martha. Um, we're presenting a new iteration of If You Lived Here um, as part of the Life Support Exhibition at Glasgow Women's Library. And of course, the original project began in New York in 1989. And we were just hoping you could tell us a bit about how this project came about and also um, why it took the forms that it did. Um, the project was... Uh the outcome of my being invited by a rather uh, elite, high-end, almost boutique, nonprofit art space called the Dia Art Foundation that invited me uh, and uh, another group, group material, to share a year consecutively uh, with social projects which they never did. They are, they were, they supported um, abstract artists with a very uh, uh, unusual projects, including the Broken Kilometer and um, other things that were not in normal art galleries or museums at the time. And uh, I, um, offered a proposal of a work on homelessness, which uh, they accepted on the basis of a show on nuclear war that I had done in Colorado the preceding year. In other words, I made a presentation. And then at a certain point, I realized that although I had made all the artworks in relationship to the nuclear war project in a very large space, that in my travels as a visiting artist outside New York City, I'd seen quite a number of works on housing and more uh, acutely on homelessness that um, local artists had done, but that nobody in New York would ever dream of showing any of that kind of work because it just wasn't art and it was, uh, engaged in topicality, which was complete anathema to the art world at the time. It just simply could not be done. So I explained that I wanted to do something on homelessness and that, it, which was uh, a fairly sudden, but urgent, clearly urgent, emergent, visible project uh, problem in New York City. Everybody knew about it. Everybody talked about it. Everybody, claimed to suffer from having to step over homeless people, but the art world was uh, uh, certainly on another path. So they uh, accepted it and we agreed that I would have a show that changed over time. They were skeptical, but uh, committed. And then I realized it was not possible to do a show that was a single show for six months that changed over time because people wouldn't, would not know to come back. And also it was wrong because it was essentially a liberal project in which we would be somehow investigating something that we were looking at and understood and had empathy or pity for, but were not implicated in uh, or part of. So I determined that it was necessary to have at least three exhibitions, one on people fighting to save their homes, two on um, homelessness, whether publicly visible or not, because of course people live with others uh, sleeping on the couch or in some uh, godforsaken basement. People have recently died here, drowned in those godforsaken basements uh, just last month. And the third would be about a, a utopian and actual revisioning of the city as a humane enterprise. Uh, and that uh, I would invite people engaged in all kinds of relationship to homelessness, including homeless people. And advocates and activists and um, legal representatives and um, artists and filmmakers and poets and whoever was interested and, uh, and painters, as you can see. Um, 
uh, on the basis of one rather strict rule I had, which was I didn't want to see any pictures of people lying on the ground. That if you wanted to see people lying on the ground, you could step outside uh, into the real world. And that that is not what this was about. And there were, um, there were going to be town hall meetings, which is, you know, open meetings that, that uh, include the public. Um, and there was going to be one for each show. And I added one, which was on the question of artist housing, which was an extremely contentious issue about whether the extremely slim number of um, subsidized housing vouchers would be applied to artists, all of whom considered ourselves basically privileged in comparison, and yet needing specialized housing in comparison to poor people, I should say. So that was the genesis of the project and the sponsors were skeptical. Uh, they were not terribly helpful in organizing things, but they did give me handlers and uh, doled out the money, so I can't complain, but their relationship to it was kind of, um, shall we say, paying its dues to the fact that the art community um, probably was way more engaged in questions of embeddedness and social life than the institution itself. I don't know if that was clear, but that is the story of how this got going. Yeah, and I think it's um, really, really helpful as well to have this um, slideshow playing, actually, so we can actually see what it actually looked like in the original iteration, which, of course, was over three decades ago now. And Yes, and I, I do want to interrupt and say, at this moment, we're looking at the inside of the reading room. I had a library built into the shows. Nobody at that time would have dreamed of having libraries and reading rooms and exhibitions in major institutions. So um, I felt that it was important to have flyers about current uh, uh, actions and events, um, pamphlets that represented the present and the past and also books and a comfortable place to sit. Yeah, so a space that you could spend time and yeah, yes. and what the, the documentation that we're showing here really makes clear is that, you know, this, it, the first exhibitions really responded to a very specific um, historical um, context and geographical context as well, actually. Um, but you mentioned in the conversation recently that the archive from this project has turned into a living archive. Yes. Um, it's currently in really high demand. Um, yes. I if you could tell us a bit about its, its current life and the usage uses that the archive has been put to just now. Um, at a certain point, um, I was asked to show the archive uh, when archive shows were popular and I was completely mystified. Uh, it was Maria Lind and Anton Vidokle uh, who uh, runs Eflux. And I thought that only other curators would be interested in looking at paperwork about a show that at that point, it was uh, 10 years ago. So it was already at least 20 years old. And they said, but um, this has been an important show for curators and people trust us really will want to see this, the paperwork. So I agreed to that. And in the interim, um, from the beginning, within a year of the show, I was being invited to come and talk about it which completely shocked me because I thought that after the run of the show, no one would care. And that was that, but far from it, my first invitation was to uh, the North of England uh, and a curatorial thing called something like after midnight or something like that. I'm sorry. I can't quite remember. Uh, and I was stunned because why would a curator care? Um, and since then many request to talk about it. I was invited to South Africa for the same thing. Many, many curators 
were looking for a way to open their own institutions to this kind of work. Uh, but the archive show after uh, it was at EFLUX, uh, so I'm jumping now back to 2005, let's say, it was requested in two other venues in Europe, at which point I remembered that I had actually sent around to a number of places, including the Corotol, um, Xerox copies of these original shows to go along with some documents and so on, so that people would have a sense of uh, what it was since they were requesting it. Um, and so it went to Utrecht and uh, to uh, Barcelona. And in both places, there were more and more uh, visuals because I do feel that it's important to have more than letters asking for things or outlining them. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a number of these things are in this PowerPoint. Uh, a number of these images were uh, circulated as uh, photocopies, color photocopies and others. And at, in each place, I collected material about what was happening there because once it started traveling, and even in New York, once it was shown in EFLUX, I said, we cannot do a show about housing that occurred in 1989 without collecting material about where we are right now, which is Chinatown, New York, and collect material from around the US from 2005. And so in Utrecht, we did the same, and in Barcelona, and it was then shown in places like Rennes, where the students actually insisted, I told them they couldn't show it, and they said, no, we'll have a local project. And in fact, it was built on a local project from Rennes and in which they collected a great deal of material on sans-abri, on the unhoused, and um, interviewed people. And uh, that are, is the way that I would like this material to circulate. And except for a show in uh, uh, just a couple of years ago in uh, the Reina Sofia in Madrid by one of the best curators I've worked with in my life, which is Jorge Ribalta, and therefore I trusted him, where he wanted only a portion of the homeless show, which is what we're looking at now. Uh, so normally there is, as in your exhibition, the, uh, the surrounding material is the important material, which is what are we doing here and now in this place? And I think that the reason that curators and others have asked to show this repeatedly, the, this documentation of something in 1989, uh, New York City art world, is as a way of creating a line of continuity with the effort to present, give voice to, and represent a problem that is so far a, shall we say, a very long-term element of particularly neoliberal urban planning and gentrification. That is frank, outright, homeless populations growing ever greater even in the richest state in our nation, which is California, and all up and down the West Coast. Sorry, my voice is uh, <laughs> cooperating. I mean, we only have a couple, you know, a minute or so left, but I was just going oh, to- Oh, so I talk my way through it. It goes so fast, doesn't it? But um, as you know, I'm really interested in reclaiming if you lived here for histories of feminist art. Um, I think I've said yes. already that Feminism is, of course, just as relevant to housing as it is to housework. Um, and you did dedicate the book that was associated with the original iterations um, to women around the world who organise their buildings and their blocks and their neighbourhoods to secure decent conditions for everyone and to maintain a sense of place. Um, but I think the feminist dimensions of this project were really kind of under the surface. They were bubbling away under the surface. Um, and this perspective wasn't really overt. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, 
why you was it a conscious decision to sort of approach the project in this way to sort of not foreground feminism or was yes it, right yes my i decided to take my cues from what i was presented with in relationship to the various groups i was working with without imposing an ideological framework and i would include feminism and um socialism uh as my general so uh, filters, but I wanted to listen to and follow the guidelines of the groups that were willing to participate. Many of them had a high percentage of women participants, as we can see here, the Madhousers building. Uh, they, were, they were from Atlanta building um, huts for the homeless, which were small houses for their clients. Uh, who they helped walk through social services. And um, women led or were the advocates for many of the groups, but I think many of the groups at that time um, would not have either wanted or even understood why the need for homes would uh, privilege a conversation from a feminist viewpoint, though we certainly had that. But I did not want it to be a formal element because that's not what, what people were telling me. That emerged as a theme somewhat later. Um, but as you say, I dedicated the book to those women as a way of saying, oh, and by the way, guess who does the work? And this uh, and who suffers the consequences because what do maintenance and reproduction depend on if not a stable abode? Uh, but uh, this lesson has re-emerged as we knew already in the 1960s uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement because uh, it was organized by women and led by women and in the Black community in particular, although there are strong male leaders, a great deal of the grassroots organizing is done by women among women. Uh, people like Ella Baker, for example. That's brilliant. I think that will lead really nicely onto our conversations later. So thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and I wish that I could be there with you, and I wish that I had been able to take part in the organization of the show itself. We did our best. I do want to say quickly, that is a picture of a man lying down. It was the only one. It was a project by students, and it was a banner that said that it was the LA's official housing project for the homeless, which is a picture of a man sleeping on a park bench. In other words, forget about it, guys. That's it. So ideological frame. Thank you so much. Thank you.